Good evening and welcome to tonight's regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. Um, just uh, for the audience and the public to know, we will have our regular agenda, if you want to call it that. And at the end of our agenda, we will hear from Mr. Dave Peterson, um, our consultant and search firm consultant on the new superintendent search on all the community feedback from the focus groups that we've heard on what people want to see and the characteristics they want to see in the next superintendent. So for those of you watching, that will be at the end of the agenda. That said, um, let's, uh, anybody has cell phones, please turn them off so we don't get the reverb back through the RF. And with that, I'll ask the secretary to call the, call the roll. Gladly. President Wasserman? Here. Vice President Baker? Here. Secretary Kaminsky? Here. Treasurer Brandstaff? Here. Member Gordon? Here. Member McFarland? Here. Member Vander Kellen? Here. We're all, all here. All president accounted for. Um, the first item we'll move into is our consent agenda. Um, I'll take uh, uh, a motion on the consent agenda, and then we can discuss additions or deletions. So moved. Support. Moved by just uh, Dr. Kaminsky and supported by Ms. Branstad. Any additions, deletions, or corrections or clarifications? I'll take silence as none. Um, close the discussion. All in favor of the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. We'll now move into requests to address the board. We have no formal uh, pre-requests. Anybody in the audience tonight wish to address the board? Seeing none, we'll move into Board of Education matters and presentations of the board, and I'll turn it over to Carl. Uh, yes, I'd recommend that you take a look at uh, agenda item 4.1 and consider approval mm -hmm. of A, B, and C all in one motion, and I'll review all three of them. If you want to do it differently, feel free to let us know. Uh, we're talking about approval of capital project bids. Uh, the, the board has previously approved back when you approved any sinking fund work law that was uh, due to be done this summer from the sinking fund dollars that are left over. We always bring a recommendation for capital projects at the same time. And bids have been accepted and a tabulation has been provided for the board for asbestos abatement. Uh, this is item number A. The work to be performed includes abatement of floor tile at Dow High School. The project is scheduled to be completed prior to the start of the school year this coming fall. We recommend issuing a purchase order to the low bidder Trust Thermal of Owasso, Michigan for the amount of $15,150. As I mentioned, the project is part of the previously approved 2013 capital projects by the Board of Education and funding was included in the 2013 capital projects. Item bid uh, follows the same process, or item B. Bids have been accepted and a tabulation provided for the board for district floor tile replacement. That work is to be performed and it includes replacement of the floor tile, carpeting and vinyl base in the main office areas and classrooms at Dow High School. Again, uh, work to be completed prior to the start of the 13-14 school year. Uh, administration recommends issuing a purchase order to the low bidder Northeastern Paint and Flooring of Saginaw, Michigan for the amount of $16,908. Again, previously approved and funding included in the 13 capital projects budget. Uh, item C, bids have been accepted and a tab provided for district <coughs> parking lot crack ceiling. Um, the work is to be performed, ceiling, I should say S-E-A-L-I-N-G. The work to be performed includes asphalt parking lot and drive crack ceiling at both high school building sites Again, work to be completed before the fall, following the same process as the previous two. We would recommend issuing a purchase order to the low bidder Highway Maintenance Construction of Romulus, Michigan for the amount of $17,252. Board's pleasure, I'll accept the motion for 4.1 A, B, and C, or A, B, or C. I'll move to approve the capital bids, A, B, and C. A, or A. A, B, and C, okay, moved by Member McFarland and supported by uh, Member uh, Treasurer, I'm sorry, Treasurer Branstad. Uh, any discussion or questions? I did have a question. The, uh, the, the list that we held off on for sinking fund projects, this was or was not part of that? No, this, uh, I don't believe now, Mr. Costas is here. Okay. I don't believe we planned on using sinking fund dollars. There were some things 
that didn't get accomplished when we pulled back right. Um, right. We delayed, Dr. Uh, Kaminsky. Yeah. And yeah. Assuming that we would have a successful uh, May 7th election, mm -hmm. uh, we would insert those projects into Good. the next 10-year Th That was my period. question. Yep. Those, are, uh, those won't be started until after we know certain our, our funding. And At this point in time, that's okay. true. Real good. Good questions. <clears throat> any more? Well, are the teachers and the students having any input on the design for the new carpet and flooring? Uh, I can't really answer that. Uh, Mr. Costas, you want to step up? and uh, I think we've reached out to the administration, but we'll let the guy that really knows answer that question. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the school principal. I talked to the school principal who collects the, gets the information, you know. The, but we're, we really kept the uh, tile consistent with the colors that we've been putting in Dow High. In this case, it's all at Dow High, and it's a, it's a color we've been using throughout. So uh, there's a little bit of carpet in the office, and um, um, the office people, including the principal, selected the color, which is real similar to what they have, which is green. Okay. <laughs> what a surprise. Surprise, right. surprise. <laughs> right. All right. So okay. But the tile pretty much matches what's there. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? That said, we'll move into a vote on 4.1 A, B, and C inclusive. I'll take a roll call vote, John. Okay, sure. Spending money. President Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Baker? <clears throat> yes. Myself, Secretary Kaminsky? Yes. Treasurer Branstad? Yes. Member Gorton? Yes. Member McFarland? Yes. And member Vander Kellen. Yes. Okay. Seven ohm for motion. You know, okay. Unanimous. Um, we'll then move into the finance portion. And the first thing we have on the agenda is the FFO study committee minutes from about a week ago. And I'll hand it over to Treasurer Branstad. All right. We met last Tuesday night. And um, we had many things on the agenda. Um, we had a discussion. All right, um, we started out discussing the fact that we have a trust agreement with Chemical Bank and Trust to handle funds that have been donated to the district to provide scholarships for students. Um, in practice, the funds have been handled as a custodial account rather than a trust since state law limits the investment option for schools. So to more um, accurately reflect how the account is handled and to avoid trust management fees, we are going to ask the district's attorney to draft an agreement releasing the assets from the trust but leaving them in the custody of Chemical Bank. Um, we had a lot of discussion about uh, workers' compensation expenses and have decided to continue being self-funded. Um, let's see. We looked at the latest um, proposals from the five firms that we had previously requested um, audit requests for proposals <coughs> from and knowing that we have our May 7th election we had gone back to each one of them and asked them to please update their um, proposals to us and so we are going to I think is it later that we're recommending tonight who to go with um, Cynthia Marchese um, joined us and talked about um, negotiations with the Midland City Education Support Personnel Association. We talked about some um, election related issues. Um, one being that during the past thinking fund we worked with Wolgrass Construction and Integrated Designs Incorporated for construction management and architectural services. And although both provided excellent service to the district, um, we felt it was good business practice that if the thinking fund ballot is successful, that we will issue a request um, for a proposal for each. And we will be prepared to do that um, very shortly after the May 7th election. Um, we also talked about the district had an opportunity to avoid the cost of using an underwriter to sell the bonds by selling directly to a local bank. So doing so may change the number of issues from two to three, but it won't change the overall length of time required to fully repay the bonds. And the first issue will be sold by June 30th, 2013, will be repaid within eight years. And the final issue will be sold um, by May of 2018 and will be repaid by 2025. And the intention of that was it would actually save the district money or put more of that money back into our hands that we can use um, for our students. A group representing high school level travel baseball teams has approached us about raising funds to improve the baseball field at Dow High School. Um, doing so would allow the group to bring large baseball tournaments to the community during the summer. 
There are many details to settle, but we, um, the district is supportive of efforts to improve them. So Mrs. Klein is going to work with the athletic directors and the maintenance staff to further investigate this offer. Um, I think they wanted to use both of our baseball fields. Um, Dow High was the one they deemed to not be acceptable at this time for what they wanted to use it for. Uh, Mrs. Klein presented a proposal for addressing the problems caused by a shortage of substitute bus drivers. Since it would require a change to Appendix D of how Midland schools work, the next step will be to <coughs> review it with Human Resources Study Committee. Uh, Mr. Ellinger gave an update on the progress of negotiating a contract with Synergistic. Um, if we are unable to resolve an issue regarding the hiring of the energy specialist, we may not proceed with signing the contract. Um, and since um, the three of us were scheduled to meet with the superintendent search consultant that evening. We um, had limited time to discuss the 2013 budget, but there was a general agreement that moving the budget workshop till after the election would allow the board to consider a less speculative document while still providing administration adequate, adequate time to prepare the final draft. And the next time we will be meeting will be on um, at 4 o'clock on Tuesday, May 7th, election day. Um, I'll open up to question or comment, but I'd just like to, for abundance of clarity, um, FFO has not made a decision because we can't make decisions on insurance carriers or RFPs. We are making recommendations to the full board. Okay. Recommendations to the full board for a vote will be coming at, at future meetings. And any other questions or comment? Carl, do you want to comment on the budget workshop? timing at this time? Um, I can. I think uh, Mrs. Young sent an email out to all of you and the intent would be to cancel the budget workshop that was scheduled um, I believe the afternoon of the 29th from 3 to 5. Um, instead um, move the budget workshop to May the 13th. Uh, the time I think is in the agenda here if I recall. Oh it's not. And I think that email said you got to refresh my memory four to six, uh, then there would be a break time and we would have our regularly scheduled meeting on the 13th uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. And then instead of coming back to the 29th, uh, there would be a closed session meeting for the board, I think from three to five, Correct. related to the superintendent search. Yeah, we're basically recommending we take the time that was allotted to do the budget workshop yes. to be the time to do the closed session portion of the superintendent search. That will make for a little earlier evening on Monday night since people are coming here at that time, already previously scheduled to come at that time. The new add to your calendar would be the May 13th, 4-6 to 6 budget workshop. And the new deletion would be that the April 29th meeting from 5 o'clock on will go away, but not from 3 to 5. 3 to 5 will remain. And maybe, Mrs. Young, you can double check that email because I'm thinking it might be 4.30 to 6.30 with a half hour break, or was it 4 to 6? It was 4 to 6, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions on the FFO? Seeing none, we'll move to uh, Ms. Klein on donations. Yes, we have 10 <coughs> gifts for information this evening. They total $17,825.80. Four of them are from the H.H. Dow High School Athletic Booster Club. And that would be for the sports of golf, tennis, girls' soccer, and softball. Uh, the remaining gifts are from the American Chemical Society to support the Midland High School Science Department, TNW Management for Midland High Girls' Golf, the Kenny Lou Wold Educational Endowment Fund at the Midland Area Community Foundation, which is supporting an at-risk program for students at Midland High School, Midland Kiwanis Foundation supporting East Lawn Elementary fifth grade trip, Adams PTO for some wish list items, and the Mary E. McIntyre Memorial Athletic Fund, which is also at the Midland Area <laughs> Foundation. And that is a donation to the Midland High School Athletic Department and to support the athletic participation fees for those students for whom they're waived for financial reasons. Thank you. And thanks to all the donors. Mm -hmm. next Roll into the next one. Yep. All right. Well, as you heard in our study committee minutes, uh, we did discuss the audit RFP. That's a request for proposal. And we were very fortunate because 
last fall, the Claire Gladwin Regional Education Service District, you might know that as the Claire Gladwin ISD, uh, coordinated a release of a request for proposal for audit services for any interested districts in the local area. And under the terms of the RFP, each district gets to select individually with the firm best meeting our own needs. There was no obligation that all of the districts participating needed to select the same firm. And in fact, I believe there are some firms that may have bid on some districts and not on others. In our case, we had five firms from across Michigan who submitted formal proposals to provide audit services to us. And then following your action in February to hold the bond and sinking fund election, I contacted all five and asked them to provide additional information. I sent them the official ballot language so that they could see the time, the duration, and the amounts, and asked for them to provide estimated cost and hours for auditing those programs as well. Uh, after receiving all of that, and all five did respond back with estimates on uh, auditing both bond and sinking fund and, and the hours. And so we looked at each one, evaluated for price, experience with similar districts, the credentials of those that they identified who would be performing our audit. And we also contacted references, including for Yo and Yo, although they've done our audit for many years, this would be a new auditor. And after evaluating all of those, we recommend entering into a three-year agreement with our current auditors, Yo and Yo. And they have been our auditors since 1972-73, although with the retirement of Mari McKenzie, we would have a new principal in charge, and that would be David Youngstrom. I believe you might have had the opportunity to meet him last fall. And Mr. Youngstrom is, in addition to being a Board of Ed member for Freeland Community Schools, so he understands what it's like on your side of the table, he does have extensive experience working with other districts that are similar to Midland, both in size and funding structure. It's very important to us that we find an auditor that understands the 20J situation, because although we don't continue to receive 20J funding, we still have some remnants of that with, through our Hold Harmless millage and not qualifying for at risk. And we, as what, that was one of the, the criteria we used in looking at the five proposals, was to say, have they worked with districts where that's been their experience? So you have the prices that were provided. And over the course of three years, the total for the audit would be $78,600. Total for the sinking fund, $1,800. Total for the bond, $2,400. So the total cost would be $82,800. And just for your background, the agenda does show what our costs have been for the prior years. And most recently, we paid $26,600 for the audit of the 11-12 year. And that included not a, only the ordinary audit, but audit of sinking fund as well. So it would be our recommendation that uh, we approve a three-year agreement with Yo and Yo. Can I take a motion? I move that we approve um, item 5.3. Support. Moved by Treasurer Branstad, supported by uh, Secretary Kaminsky. Any questions uh, or comments to Linda? Um, yes, I have a few. Why are we going with a three-year contract on this? Uh, they Each one was asked to bid on three years. And they were given the option, they, they could provide an additional five years. And it just seemed like three years was a better choice than committing to the full five. But we do have okay. that option. Okay. If we would want to. And I had benchmarked with Bloomfield Hills and David Youngstrom. He is their lead auditor and he does a wonderful job there. And he also helps them achieve the ASBO Meritorious Budget Award. And I'm wondering if we can contract him to help us with that. I talked with him, and Bloomfield Hills actually receives two, and it, internally we call it ASBO, uh, two ASBO awards. They receive the Certificate of Excellence for Financial Reporting and the Meritorious Budget. Uh, because he is the district auditor, he may not legally or ethically work with them on their budget development, but he does work with them very closely on achieving their Certificate of Excellence for Financial Reporting. So we would be able to work with him if we wanted to pursue that award. 
uh, but he may have no hand in any of the development of our budget because he has to sit on the other side of the table and question us about our budgeting practices. Hmm. And I, I talked with him directly about that because I'd heard that that was an interest. So he could not provide any consulting services? Not us? on the budget development, no. He could on the broader question of our financial reporting, though. And essentially does to a large degree in our audits. We get a lot of feedback back on, on that type of thing as mm -hmm. part of the audit, not just yeah. numbers. I know when we looked at some of the auditing firms, we looked at some of the district sizes that other, mm -hmm. when we put this out to bid, I think it's good business practice to put it out. It's been so such a long time since we've done that. They've done a great job. Um, the references were good, and I felt that they were competitive and a good fit for the district as far as what we do. And it was just great to, just like we're trying to revisit that as the FFO report had said, some of the other organizations that we do business with, I think it's good to go back and make sure that they're competitive, check and put it out there. And not only competitive, but be able to do the quality of work. Some of the other firms had not dealt with districts of our sure. size or complexity, especially with bonds and Multiple sinking problems. funds yep. and 20 J's and all that nice stuff. So it was really reconfirming that we're getting a reasonable price for the complexity we have. Mm -hmm. yep. well, Linda, then as far as consulting goes, are any of the other accounting firms that you receive bids from likely source of consulting? Uh, I would say three of them probably work with smaller districts. And if we were looking for consulting services, I probably would want to release another RFP for that because there's a very well-known accounting firm that does provide a consulting services that for whatever reason chose not to bid on the audit. And I believe it may be because they did call me and ask me some questions about the district. And one of them was they wanted to know what it was that we were paying for our current audit. And I suspect they may have concluded that they could not be competitive. So I would want to go back and do a, a separate RFP if we wanted consulting work done on the budget. And, and I'd want us to be just a little careful of going down the path of saying that we need that uh, kind of uh, <coughs> consulting advice, Kim. I mean. Uh, Yo and Yo has a great reputation in the Midland area. A lot of us know that. And uh, at least in my six years of being here, and I'm fairly certain that in the previous superintendent's seven years, um, the audit results that have come back that have been accepted by the board have been stellar. I, and um, I know you've raised that issue a time or two before about would we benefit from a consultant coming in and helping us. We've discussed that at FFO. And I'm not sensing that from other board members that we need that kind of assistance. So perhaps this is the kind of discussion that would be carried to a board workshop um, or a strategic planning session uh, when you have new administrators sitting here with you. It, quite frankly, I wouldn't recommend that. I don't see the need for it. Well, Plant Moran specializes in the student management section of it. And if we're precluded from using Yo and Yo for consulting, and especially David Youngstrom, because he is uh, highly educated about Bloomfield Hills financial would statements. Would you care to make a motion to do that? Sure, that would be great. I would like to make a motion to receive a bid from Plant Moran to uh, consider um, consulting for us on student management and aligning that with our finances. Can any, I'm sorry, any second? No one wishes a second? Motion fails for support of a second. Okay. Okay. And just a point of clarification, I don't know if we had a vote on our motion that was on the table. So no, we didn't. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, can sorry. go to that Oops, next. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> any, any other discussion on the original motion on the table? Oh, I have one other item about, um, the synergistic bid, it sounds like you're having problems with that going through. Well, that's not germane to the issue we're talking about. Oh, Maybe yeah. we can bring that. Yeah, let's, let's, let's finish this discussion on the, okay. on yeah, the bids. On the bids and we'll come back. That would have been appropriate for the FFO question earlier. Any other questions on the bid? Seeing none, uh, I'll move into a roll call vote. So if you'll take a roll call, then. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Vice President Baker? Yes. Myself, Secretary Kaminsky, yes. Treasurer Branstad? Yes. 
Member Gordon? Yes. Member McFarland? Yes. Member Vanderfellen? Yes. 7 0. Okay. Now, uh, Kim, you did ask a question that refers back to the FFO study, so I'd entertain that question. Okay. Um, my sister's on the Grand Rapids School Board, and they are looking at energy savings, and they're working with Calvin College and an intern who will come in for them. They'll come in for free for two years and work with them, and I'm just wondering if we can pursue that to see if it's going to be more of a cost savings to yeah. the district. Well, why don't I step back, because I want to answer your question about synergistic to Kim. Uh, uh, Jerry knows this because he's been in on some of the conversations, and so does London, Gary, and Kathy. Uh, we are not going to sign a contract um, with synergistic. The board authorized me to do that on behalf of the district. Um, if we could work out what we thought was an acceptable contract. And um, I'll tell you, uh, there was some language in the contract that penalized the district rather severely if at some point in time in the first four years we wanted to pull out. And there was some large sums of money that I could understand why they would be inserted in that contract because they would come in and during that course of time uh, bring their expertise on their uh, uh, energy savings program that um, they just don't want anybody to do and come in and, and gain from that and then bow out of the contract, you know, in the early years. But also in that contract was some language where both they and the district had to agree on who the energy specialist was going to be. And there, some, there were some requirements there that uh, we just could not get comfortable with and uh, put them in a driver's seat more than I thought we should take a risk um, with. And so... Um, they understand that they have our final offer if they would like to negotiate that further um, there to contact us. Since I communicated that position, we've not had any contact with them since then. The owner of this company is down in Texas, and uh, we thought they would really like to have us as one of their customers and establish a presence that they used to have in this region with Mount Pleasant and with Saginaw Township. Um, but I just didn't think it was in the best interest of the district to agree to that language. And, and Jerry was in the loop on all of this. I think we all agree. What and we, we would do, yeah, we, just yeah, we discussed it at FFO. FFO as well. What I think we could do, and our attorney has pointed out to us, is that there are a number of other options available to us to look at really behavior modification when it comes to adjusting to our utility usage um, here in the district. And that I think as part of that larger exploration, what will those other companies look like? They apparently have some contract language that's not as punitive as synergistic. Um, and then I think we would need some time to explore that, potentially bring a recommendation back to the board. And if we're going to do that, I'd be happy to have us reach out to Calvin right. and have an intern work with us. It, my experience with interns is when you're dealing with professional companies that can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got uh, years and years of experience with professionals that have been doing it much longer than an intern would. I'd be surprised that if um, they could compete with that. But who knows until you ask. And so we'd be happy to do that. Okay, great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think, Carl, you summarized it right on, on behalf of, uh, as president, and I'll speak for FFO a little bit because I'm on it. Um, there was just contract language that put us in a position of little flexibility in who we hired and how we hired the internal person that would work with these people. And it just really, and the penalties that would come if we didn't do that or some other things that happened. And it, it while they assured us it's never happened in any of their experience, um, I didn't want to, certainly didn't want us to be the first one. And it was a big enough penalty that it just made no sense. And uh, we didn't under we understood a little bit their intransigence on the issue, but we provided lots of other options to make them feel good, and they just wouldn't accept that. So it's just best to, sometimes the best deals you make are the deals you don't make. And, and we, to make it as simple as you can, the bottom line is, uh, we wanted to have an agreement between them and us on who that person was going to be, and then sign the contract. Uh, versus signing the contract, which puts the penalty language in place, before you have the agreement, and we wouldn't budge on that, and I wouldn't think you'd want me if to. If we never found the right person, yeah, we owe them a ton of money. It would mm. be, be crazy. Okay, well, okay. good. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to human resources, and we have an HR committee meeting uh, report from Lynn. Yeah, we do. We met on Thursday, April 11th, 
And the first item of business was discussing uh, the bus driver proposal. And Mrs. Klein presented the committee with a proposal for addressing the problems caused by a shortage of substitute bus drivers, which uh, Angela alluded to. And next, the uh, district continues to negotiate with the Midland City Educational Support Personnel Association, whose contract expired on September 30th of 2012. And the district and the association will meet again on April 17th. Next, uh, Ms. Varshis uh, brought us up to date on uh, workers' compensation case and the associated future cost to the district. And then next informed the committee of two issues involving staff members with um, discipline issues. And lastly, Mr. Verlindi gave the committee an update on the staffing and the process that continues. And our next meeting, I had to read this twice, is not until <laughs> next October. And these minutes are available out in the hallway <coughs> as well as the FFO. Any questions or comments to Lynn? See none, I'll hand it over to Mr. Verlinde. Thank you, Mr. Wasserman. Following staff members have announced their retirement effective uh, of the date indicated. We have two teachers, and the effective date would be June 13, 2013. And that's uh, Ms. Cheryl Collins, teacher at Jefferson Middle School, and Ms. Uh, Deb Randall, teacher at East Lawn Elementary. And then also we have a bus driver who will be retiring effective June 1, and that'd be Ms. Florence Mapes over at transportation and we thank them for their service and then the board and the staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of mrs. Nyla Lebsack who passed away on March 23rd mrs. Lebsack taught in the business education department at Midland High School for 31 years retiring in 2002 thank you any questions for for Gary Seeing none uh, in your agenda, you'll see correspondence to and from the Board of Education that's occurred since our last meeting. And you'll see our scheduled activities um, April 29th, again now, beginning at 3 o'clock with a closed session for the superintendent search. And I don't think, as Cindy said, the May 13th one um, reflects yet the uh, front end meeting of the, of the new um, budget workshop. And to be abundantly clear on the abundant work, uh, workshop, it was spoken about, I'd like to highlight it for the public. The reason we are postponing that is because of the delay in where the certainty is on the funding in terms of governor's proposal, house proposal, and senate proposal. And if we come forward now, we'd all be guessing at what they're going to do, just leaving more uncertainty. And, and when we've had to do that in the past, and we've had to do it in the past when we didn't get numbers until October or September or July of the following year, you end up having to take a very conservative approach because you have to take a conservative approach. And so rather than us guessing at the number and taking a conservative approach at the number, we're waiting until we get more certainty to have the meeting on that day. Plus two other reasons, uh, yeah. Jerry. The May Revenue Sharing Conference for the state of Michigan should be over by then, and our election results uh, could be over. And yeah. if both those election proposals are successful, over a 10 year period of time, if you assume you need what we're asking for, there could be $75 million of relief to the general fund over a decade. So, Or conversely, if they don't pass, yes. a, a hit to yeah. the general fund. So in all honesty in my career, when you've got three major things like that, some uncertainty with the legislative budget, the election, um, uh, in the May Revenue Sharing Conference, it, it makes all kinds of sense to hold off on a budget workshop for the following year. As much certainty as we can. Yep. Okay, um, that opens up uh, to the next part of the agenda. We now go into hearings from board members. We'll do those now and announcements from Carl, and then we'll move into the superintendent focus study group results. Um, I think I started left last time, didn't I? Who got to go first last time? Me. Kim did? Okay. I'll let Scott go first this time. I have uh, nothing to say this evening. <laughs> That's my time. Angela. I don't have a lot to say. I know it's been a pretty rough last week, and um, before that was spring break, and um, 
I guess the only other thing I want to say is I'm not sure that we're going to meet again before the election. Is that a true statement in a public? In an open session. In an open that session. That would be correct. So I would really like to encourage people not only to go out and vote, but before you vote, make sure that you become informed on what you're voting on. Don't Please don't make any assumptions. Really look into why we're doing what we're doing. We would not be asking the public um, for these two if we didn't feel like it was absolutely necessary to um, maintain the level of excellence that we have for our students here in Midland. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's been a busy week. Uh, I know Carl and uh, President Wasserman, you've been out with uh, various organizations, and it's been a uh, I don't know how much, if you have any room left on your calendar, I mean, just getting out and talking to a lot of the community groups, and uh, it's, it's been a pretty busy time um, educating the community. I've, I've had numerous discussions and um, passing out some of the pamphlets, and, and I think that there's, uh, there's many opportunities to educate our public as far as what we're trying to do. And I have talked to some individuals in the community to say that I'm retired or I'm on a fixed income, this is going to be hard for me to do, and just explaining to them the reason why we've gone um, to ask uh, for this election for the uh, the sinking fund and, and the technology bond, but also uh, understanding in how far or how long ago we started, what the community survey showed, what our our focus groups have showed, and so forth, and and I think we're getting uh, plenty of opportunities for the public to understand what amazing things the kids are doing with the with the iPads and with the technology bond, and some of the security benefits and so forth, and I think that. Getting that understanding, allowing um, individuals to hear, you know, where did we start? How long ago did we uh, start doing our homework? I think that um, overall, I think we've had a lot of support in the public, but it, it is a difficult thing to ask of people. And I think when they realize the, the reason why and what we can do for education, I think they're they're quite excited about it. Yvonne, I really have nothing to say this evening either. Lynn, I actually have several. Just. I'll make up for that for those that are a little quieter. I've been sent a couple different items, and um, I received an email from uh, Laura Peterson, who is one of our media head media specialists, and uh, she wanted me to share this. The Middle School Media Co Center Consolidation Project um, worked with United Way. We had 17 individuals from the Young Leaders United Group which consists of young professionals from Dow Chemical, Yider Insurance, Chemical Bank, and Midland Hospital. They spent two hours at Jefferson <coughs> Middle School, and uh, this was their first volunteer project for this group, and they were excited to be offering their volunteer efforts to assist in the educational community. And uh, just reflects, again, the great support Midland Public Schools has from volunteers in our community. So I wanted to share that from Laura. And then also, some of you may have seen the, the recognition that was given to um, Chad Johnson at Northeast um, for, for his great work working with uh, a young man that he invited to participate um, on the basketball team and the football team who has uh, some special needs. And so Chad's a really, he's a great guy if you know him, and he is, does a lot at Northeast. So I thought that was very nice that they took the time to, special for a special honor for him and then let's see this one is kind of near and dear my daughter was involved with IB art and their project their kind of end of the year project is being shown at the Alden B Dow home and studio starting on Wednesday night I think is the opening so if anybody has a chance public um, staff students you want to get get over there and um, at the Alden B Dow home and studio uh, different times on the several days this week the kids will be re have their artwork up and reflected and administration building doesn't have to um, put up with holes in the wall and and nails but I'm sure you'll miss all that gorgeous art mm -hmm. so any I wanted to share that and Midland High is presenting their musical Man of La Mancha this week and let's see and lastly, for Midland High, hopefully next next month I'll, I'll showcase Dow High, uh, but their symphonic band just went to uh, Kalamazoo, to Western Michigan last week, and I had hoped to be able to go, but uh, I, I was not able to. But they were one of two Mid Michigan high school bands that were invited to perform at the Western Michigan University Spring Conference on Wind and Percussion Music, 
And uh, this is a pretty prestigious event. And in addition, Kathy Peretz, their director of orchestras and the assistant director of bands, was a guest conductor for one of the selections. So it was quite an honor for them to spend the day at uh, Western Michigan with some other fantastic musicians and performers and directors last week. Um, and I guess I'd like to just say thank you to people that have been attending our Tech Fund and our Sinking Fund <laughs> presentations and our superintendent search sessions. So there's been just lots going on. And I thought, well, I'd take the time tonight to acknowledge all those things. So thank you. Kim. I want to thank the Midland Area Community Foundation and Saginaw Valley State University for gathering and analyzing data to come up with the 13 initiatives to improve the community. I see many potential synergies that will be very helpful to the students of Midland County. Thank you for taking this initiative and I hope shortly we will be able to work together to create sustainable projects for the benefits of the students. And I would also like to thank the League of Women Voters for backing both the school millage proposals, the money is needed to move the schools to the 21st century, and thank you Carl and Jerry for doing a wonderful job talking to the League of Women Voters. And I also wanted to say that the Warner family and all of the people touched by Jake are all in my thoughts and prayers as we try to recover from this tragic loss. Thank you. Um, I'll keep my comments. I'll keep this one particularly short. Thanks to the Northeast staff and students and parents and, and parents of Jake for what they went through in the last week. And uh, my heart's out to you. Uh, second, um, thanks to all the people coming to the focus meetings that you mentioned that we're going to hear about here in a few minutes. Uh, pretty good attendance and uh, uh, very pleased with the input we've gotten and uh, the, the amount of input we've gotten. And lastly, on the uh, millage elections, the millage and the sinking fund. Uh, we have some community sessions coming up uh, to discuss those. And Carl, I can't remember the dates off the top of my head. Got them in the calendar. Um, but please uh, look on our website and please come to those if you want an explanation um, of why we're asking for what we're asking for and what it does for us and why the amounts are set what they're set and why the timings are what they are. That will all be explained. But in Reader's Digest form, you saw the interview we got to in the paper and thanks to the Midland Day News for their prominent display. You know, this is local money for local needs. We've had Lansing dictating operating funds now for 15 years. This is a way we get an opportunity as a community to, to offer our educational experience like we used to versus what we've been dictated to by Lansing. So please think of that as you go to the polls. Um, from a sinking fund, it's 2% of our asset base. We're asking to invest 2% of our asset base back into our assets every year. That's a 50-year replacement rate. Um, and I can't deny for people who say, I just can't afford this, I understand. When Carl says that, I say that, and that's a personal decision. But from a what we're asking for perspective, we're asking for 2% for a 50-year turnover on these buildings. And it's, it's enough just to keep the roofs going, the boilers going, the wires going, et cetera, over time. Um, and, and lastly, it, the technology millage gives us a great opportunity uh, to leap forward in how we educate our kids. And the number one thing that I think we're going to get from it is more individualized I'll call it instruction and response. Pe teachers are going to be able to see what kids are learning faster and in more detail than ever before and be able to more instantly respond to those differentiations. And that's going to make a big difference in how we educate our kids going forward versus a cycle of instruct, quiz, grade, come back the next day and do things. Our, our, over time, our, we will we get much more attuned to that than traditional methods allow us to today. So that said, uh, please come to public sessions and please go out and vote. And we'd love your support. I want to be fairly brief of mine so we can get on to your uh, superintendent search business. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we put a packet of informational literature. This is not positional literature, meaning it's not promoting a position. This is informational in nature, which uh, we are allowed to do as a district. And our comments here are meant to be of the uh, same ilk. Um, we need to be informational here and not necessarily proactive in our comments. Uh, that comes at a, at a meeting outside school equipment and school time and, and so on. 
The date of those two community meetings are uh, this Wednesday, um, April 17th from 7 to 8.30 at the auditorium at the uh, Dow Library. And then again on Tuesday, April 30th, the uh, same time from 7 to 8.30. Um, you are right. We have talked to a lot of uh, folks already this month from district parent involvement committees to different senior groups to uh, civic clubs. And I think tomorrow I have four that are on my list. And I'm the only school employee that can actually talk positionally about an election on school time. Superintendents are allowed to do that. Um, I want to give a shout out to our Carpenter um, staff, our Carpenter Elementary staff, because they've been invited to present at a statewide school improvement conference. I believe it's down in Lansing uh, on the 18th this week on something that they're piloting this year called instructional rounds. And that's an opportunity for administrators, but not just administrators, but fellow teachers to get in other teachers' classrooms and really observe uh, quality instruction and teaching and learning and then share those conversations and dialogue around the building as part of their school improvement team. So it's quite an honor for them to have been selected to come down and present that, and they are looking forward to doing that. And then the last thing is a couple of you have also mentioned this. I'll tell you, um, given the tra tragic death of one of our students at North uh, East Middle School this past week, I've sent a couple different emails out to the board just acknowledging the tremendous job that our Midland Public School staff has done to support each other, most importantly to support the uh, family and the students in those buildings. And I saw evidence again of that uh, at the funeral yesterday afternoon. Uh, you would be proud to know that you had staff um, and administrators uh, and teachers uh, from all levels of the organization that attended that funeral, elementary, middle school, uh, the high schools, um, this office complex, central office. Um, it was pretty incredible, and this is a special family, let me tell you, that's wrestling with a tragedy that we hope none of us have to face. So uh, thank you to all of our staff. Um, even today, there was support again on site at Northeast Middle School. We're thinking this will be the last day that's necessary. But we even checked in, Mr. Valendi checked in at Jefferson Middle School to make sure those students were doing just fine and, and they were doing okay. So I'm very proud of our staff. I think all of you would be as a Board of Education as well. Um, and with that, I think that's all I have to offer you this evening. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments for the good of the order? I, I did. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. On Wednesday's presentation at the library, is there going to be some students available prior to that? There are going to the be iPads? some. Yeah, prior to the meeting, there will be some students there, I think, with some of their family members okay. uh, demonstrating um, the use of iPads, but once the meeting starts, they will no longer be there. So it should be a chance for some of the public to see some of the students and all elementary students hands on. So, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. We'll move on to the rest of the agenda. Carl and the directors are going to excuse themselves for the evening. And we will move on to a report by Mr. Peterson, and I'll refresh the public. Uh, uh, Dave is from School Exec Connect the firm we have hired to help us guide us through our superintendent search. How's that? Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's nice to join you again. Um, as uh, President Wasserman said, there's uh, two big things we have to do tonight. Um, first is to go over the uh, results of the focus groups and survey so that the board has a sense of what your community had to say um, uh, as a result of this. And then second, um, we have another presentation to go over uh, which begins to go over the interview process that the board will be using. And the reason we do that tonight is so that you have plenty of time to prepare and feel well prepared for your first round of interviews. Um, so I'd like to begin uh, with the survey results. Um, you asked that we conduct focus groups with a variety of stakeholder groups, and I'd like to say that um, we have never done more stakeholder groups than we did here in Midland. Um, this was the most, uh, the, the largest number of groups we have ever done on a search, and that it applies to the entire Midwest, not just Michigan. Um, that we conduct an online survey, and I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about that survey and some cautions I have about the data that we collected uh, in the survey. 
Um, and then finally, the most important part of this was to try to put this data together in some common themes and create some criteria that we would use in our interviews with the uh, candidates and that you will in turn use as you evaluate the candidates. And that's going to be the, the very end of the presentation that I, I would ask you to really focus in on because that's going to be important that you frame those things in your mind for the, for the interviews. Um, just covered that slide. Um, summary of the data collection. We had an online survey with 57 responses. That is a very low response rate. That contrasts with what we had in the focus groups. Um, just, I've, I've done some survey research in my career. If, if you were relying on this survey, I would tell you don't even consider it because it is such a low response rate for your community. I can't comment on why that is. You've got a lot going on right now. Um, and, and oftentimes, I can tell you when in a district where there are no controversies or issues of any big issues, this is, can be kind of typical. But this was a very, very low uh, online response rate. Um, this was not. Um, <laughs> um, we conducted uh, 32 meetings. Um, many of those groups, there aren't 32 groups there because many of those groups had multiple chances uh, to participate. But we had 165 attendees at those. And the quality of the groups, because you specifically reached out it to invite people, was very high. Very meaningful things, very informed people, uh, very involved. So I, I have a, a, a good deal of confidence in what we learned from the focus groups. Um, and, and I do want to say, while I don't have a great deal of confidence in the survey data, it's largely reflective of what came out in the focus group. So uh, not a big deal. And I would be very remiss if I didn't thank Mrs. Young for her assistance in scheduling these groups. It ran like clockwork. Surprise, surprise. But it was, it was a real pleasure. And uh, she also kept the water flowing when uh, <laughs> voices got tired. Um, I've already told you that. Um, Let's go uh, to the broad themes we found, um, and we're going to focus on the strengths of the district, challenges the district's faced, um, focus uh, for the first three years of the superintendent's work, and then finally attributes. Can I ask uh, a question? Will, yeah. we, will we get a copy of this at some point? Um, yes, Cindy has a, a copy okay. of it that she can right. forward to you. Um, strong teachers, principals, administrators, and staff, a common theme. And, and anything on here is a common theme. If there was an outlier issue, I've got it at the end there that I'll make you aware of, okay? But these were common themes. Um, engaged parents and a community that supports the schools in many tangible ways. Strong interdependent relationships with your community agencies and organizations. We have lots of communities with strong community organizations, but the interdependence of the relationships here is really remarkable. I, I just want to tell you that the extent to which you have programs operating in the community where people know they're great programs, but they're not quite sure whether they're from the school or from another community agency. It's, it's just a very synergistic uh, impact, and that it really improves the quality of life in your schools and, and in your community. Um, this was from the school board. No, I'm just kidding. This wasn't. Um, a good school board that listens and represents the community's interests. Um, great students, a child-focused district. Um, good extracurricular offerings, strong music and art programs, a strong curriculum, and a district compares, uh, that compares well against regional peer groups. More strengths, special education program with an emphasis on inclusion. A specific group of parents um, of students with special needs came to talk specifically about that um, and to make sure that we included questions for the uh, potential superintendent candidates on that. And high levels of student achievement, students are well prepared for college. That was a very common theme across the groups. Challenges and barriers. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, finances and revenues to maintain quality. Um, again and again and again and again, um, knowing what you've been through. Um, again, a surprise. Uh, technology on all levels, including infrastructure, st classroom applications and training. You're working on that. Um, continued implementation of a variety of uh, innovative programs, IB being an, an example, just continue to do that. Um, innovation and in new ways of teaching, teacher professional development, class sizes, changing demographics, and an increasingly diverse student population and increasing poverty. Um, again, a common theme from a variety of groups that the demographics of Midland have changed partly because of the recession and partly because of some other factors and it's creating um, challenges for the schools. Um, employee relations, no surprise to the board given what you've been through the last few years. 
um, declining enrollment, um, a need to innovate and adapt more quickly as an organization, education in the district, and this is a, a theme. I, obviously, there's editorial things that go on here, but this is something we kind of, a theme we heard that education in the district is at the cusp of change and need to implement those changes effectively. And, and I think it applies to the issues of technology, instructional improvement, a variety of, of things in that area. Um, loss of local control. Um, a number of groups, um, in particular your former school board members, lament the days when there was more local control and less less Lansing control. Uh, challenges and barriers, we just need a strong, clear vision of where we're going as a school district. We need high expectations for all, not just college-bound students, and that's that's part of that demographic issue, those those conversation threads were, were interrelated. Uh, we need a stronger internal and external communication as a school district, um, and some issues of aging infrastructure. Areas of focus for the next three years. Just to uh, clarify for the board why we ask this question. We ask people this because oftentimes if the board agrees with this, this becomes uh, a major part of the agenda for the new superintendent over the next three years, which is likely to be the length of their contract. And so it's, if, if you agree with this, um, this becomes part of your expectations in the way you evaluate your new superintendent. Implement a strategic technology plan to advance best practices and technology at all levels of the organization. Achieve financial stability. Create a collaborative, trusting team-oriented environment between central office, building administrators, teachers, and support staff. Develop a clear vision and focus for the future. Need to take the next steps toward excellence. Develop a 21st uh, century learning focus. Continue to increase student achievement and career and college readiness for all students. Continue implementation and expand innovative curricular offerings. Evaluate existing programs. Th that the focus there is, is maybe there's some things we should stop doing to start doing some new things. Um, um, improve communication both internally and with parents in the community. Um, and now we go to the desired attributes. Highly visible in both the district and the community. Be everywhere committed to the community. This is a really consistent theme here. You have so much community involvement in your schools. It's very important to all groups that the superintendent be everywhere. Um, accessible, trustworthy, strong interpersonal skills, and a good listener who will support staff. Well-spoken, excellent writing and speaking skills. A leader with a global perspective focused on innovation, 21st century skills, and research-based pra research practices. A strong educational background, success in in, as an educator. Um, there was little support for any groups for a non-traditional candidate, meaning somebody who didn't have an educational background. It was mentioned a couple of times, but it was, there was not support for it, and some groups actively talked about, we need a traditional educator. A CEO with a strong, confident personality, that came from your uh, business and foundation community, but it was also expressed in other groups. A strategic financial thinker and planner, that doesn't mean necessarily a bean counter. It means a strategic financial thinker. Okay, you've got a great business office already. You don't need somebody to duplicate that work. Um, doctor preferred by many, others see it only as preferable. A leader who will help create a clear vision. You'll see some, uh, again, themes here that came up again and again and lead toward that vision. A willing to question the status quo and lead thoughtful change. And a collaborative leader who will engage others in the work of the district. Other issues? Um, some issues that came up, and, and again, I don't think this will be any surprise to the board. Morale among teachers and building level administrators need to be improved as a result of the uh, pretty significant actions you've had to take over the last few years. Um, cabinet members stress the need for the district to support building level innovation and reduce bureaucracy. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I wanted the board, we, we had three different groups of board members that met, and I, and I at least haven't been part of a discussion where the board ever talked as a group about what they had. So I'm not, I, I just want you to see what you had to say in these meetings um, and, and ask me any questions about that because this, this is, while the f input is very important, it's important you hear it, you're the decision makers in this process. And the decision making is going to get tough from here on out. Um, um, strengths. Size of the district, you can see that what that has to say there. 
the qualification level of the community and staff. Um, this relates to your, the expectations that exist in your community. Commitment to quality education, and you can see a, a, a very articulate statement about how that translates into uh, um, a kid-centric community. Um, community expectations, and again, uh, a, a, an explanation of what that means. Um, Parents and students in our community interact and mix together regardless of socioeconomics. There's no good side of town versus bad side of town, and that's something that the new person's going to have to understand. There's equal access and opportunity. Again, the collaborative programs, the community groups run, strong curriculum, good systems in place. You're going to see something here that, that we see in districts where all the arrows are pointed in the same direction, is that the boards positions on these issues largely reflect that of what you've already seen in the community, okay, which is a good thing. Um, consistency and equity in the curriculum. Students have access to the same classes. Again, common themes. Challenges and barriers. Um, little worry about the kid-centered culture because of the aging of the community. Funding and legislative uncertainty. Um, district expectations were set when finances are good and now you're struggling with some of the issues that happen when, when finances are not good and, and what are the implications of that for the district. We need to unite people and get them working together. Again, this common theme of the district's expansion phase is past and we're, we've been in a contraction phase. What are the implications of that for the future? Money and finances. Benchmarking against other districts, we've talked about that. The current uh, political climate. Incorrect mindset that everyone is middle and is well off, we talked about that earlier. Um, growth in the uh, poverty in the district, wide economic diversity. Um, focus, um, again, very similar. Innovation in curriculum and delivery systems, enhance revenue and get the budget in balance need to be able to adapt to new environments, need to be innovative and attain number one status, prepare students to be career ready, implement IB throughout the system, maintain a culture of student achievement, technology, pass the bond and sinking fund, curriculum excellence, staff retention, continue and grow strong partnerships with the business community. Attributes, creative and innovative with resources willing to take calculated risks. Ability to recruit and select talented staff and build a high-performing team. Proven experience with running an organization. Sensitivity and commitment to the learning needs of all students. Again, that's a theme that came up and up again in all the groups. Ability to unite people around a mission or a theme, i.g. 21st century learning. Experience implementing learning models and interventions that address the individual learning needs of students at all achievement levels. Experience in working with boards a non-traditional candidate, strategic planning and visionary skills, interest-based bargaining experience, a strong leader who empowers assistance, a great communicator, high integrity, that goes without saying, um, strong values, highly approachable, a strong listener, highly visible, a knowledge of finance, can continue strong board relationships. Effective relationships with employee groups, student-focused, proactive, and can maintain city and media relationships. We've already talked about that. Um, other issues that the board brought up, prefer an education professional. That was the consensus, uh, although there were some outlying opinions on that. Prefer experience with leadership at the top, meaning, and, and we're taking that as sitting superintendent. Um, educational and, uh, oh, education and superintendent experience preferred, but very open to candidates with the right skill set. Um, I just, you can see the very low rate of survey response. Because of that, I'm going to skip over um, the survey results. They're, again, very consistent. You can go over that yourself. If you have any questions about that, you can uh, shoot me an email. But um, given the board's time, it's a very small sample to go through basically the, the same data. So with your permission, I'm going to slip through, skip through those slides. OK. Um, now, this is the. Okay, um, this is the part that's for board review. We have divided this into 
three areas. Um, the first general area uh, it pertains to educational leadership and background. And what we've attempted to do here is boil down all that data that we just went through into some just bulleted characteristics. And if you approve these, what we will do is use your interview questions to then create rubrics that will tap into these, these characteristics. There's other things you're going to want to assess as well, basic skill set stuff that I will talk about when we get to interviews. But in boiling down these characteristics, these are some of the things the board's going to want to look at as they interview candidates. A visionary educator with a global perspective and a passion for innovation and ex excellence. A leader who will focus the district's efforts on 21st century learning and research-based educational practices. An educator with high expectations for all students who can address increasing diversity and close achievement gaps where they exist. Someone who has a student-centered knowledge of curriculum, instruction, and student learning. A strong background in public education with proven success as an educator, a knowledgeable and strategic financial planner. Those would be the educational leadership categories. Um, this, second, uh, this slide pertains to what we called community leadership because there was such an emphasis here on what you were looking for in your community. And by the way, am I facing my back to the camera when I do this? I think I you're okay. I think oh, I'm okay. All right. Um, a CEO with a strong, confident personality who can maintain and strengthen relationships with a vibrant business community. A collaborative community leader who will continue to strengthen and expand collaborations with community organizations, foundations, and agencies. And a highly visible leader who will be committed to both the district and the community on a long term basis. This final category pertains to solid leadership skills and interpersonal skills uh, that we, we think uh, you should be looking for. A visionary and inspiring leader, inspiring leader who will engage and inspire others to create a clear vision for the district. A leader who is accessible, trustworthy, and a good listener who will support the staff in their work. A leader who is well-spoken and an excellent communicator in small and large groups as well as in writing. Someone who builds good teams and brings out the best in others. A leader who is willing to question the status quo and lead thoughtful change. Uh, again, this theme of collaboration, including others in decision making and building trust with and among the district's various constituencies. And Dave, does yes. this person come with his own blue suit with red shield on it? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Or she. <laughs> or she. <laughs> or she. <Yeah. laughs> but those, those are the things that we heard focus on. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, those are, there's some important themes here that differentiate you from other districts. And uh, one is the need for, every, every superintendent has to be visible, but it's the amount of visibility required um, in this community to, to maintain the collaborative uh, relationships that you have with some uh, pretty um, strong personalities who I met. Good personalities, but strong personalities. So you, you need that. Um, and school and non-school. School and non-school. School non -school. I'm, I'm talking about primarily about non-school. Yeah, non um, people with really high expectations for the superintendent of the district. Um, also, you are here looking at the perspective of, per of a person whose skills and expertise lie in instruction, curriculum, and in leadership in those areas. You're, while you want somebody who understands finance and can think big picture about finance, you're looking for a, a, an educational leader. Uh, for the district where, where it's poised um, to make the next step forward in excellence. Questions for me? Thanks Feel for free. all the work. Uh, I, I know that in the particular focus group that I sat in on <coughs> uh, with Carol, um, it, was, it was amazing because we haven't had a chance to think blue sky. Mm -hmm. And we, we discussed about a lot of, uh, we, d we sort of had a self-education process and going through it was a standard set of questions, I think, that everybody that day or on those different days All went through. Days, yeah. And uh, I mean, what I'm hearing is is uh, collaboration, innovation, team building with the number of retirements that we've had. Uh, I'm also hearing about uh, being strategic, innovation, 21st century learning. And, and I really think that we are going into the next phase where we have to innovate. Innovate and we have to grow and we have to really change in our delivery. and. Um, I think that we have so much in front of us that can fac facilitate that. So I just, um, it's really exciting to see that. And I know we got to dig in. We got a lot of work to go, but it's just great. It's a great start. It, I, I just want to stress that 
number one, the number of pe the, the number of different invitational groups that we heard from, and how common those themes were, and you captured them very nicely. Um, but also the tremendous support there is in the community for these schools. I mean, you know, you're hearing a lot of suggestions for here's what we think you ought to do, but there's a tremendous amount of support in the community for what the, the work that the staff has done, the work that the board does, and, and the work that goes on every day with the students. It's, it's really a, a remarkable community. I can contrast it with some of the other districts we've done um, in, in Oakland County where the community was very divided and, and uh, things, things were pretty messy at the beginning of some of the two superintendent searches and you should feel good that you're not facing those kinds of challenges. You're facing this, how do we take a really good district and just move it up and, and find a leader to do that. Somebody else? I guess the thing I found most interesting, because Dave collects input from lots of different people and he comes in semi unvarnished about Midland. He gets some first impressions when he comes and mm -hmm. here's some things. And I think because we're so used to it that we sometimes don't see some things. And and the thing that I thought was the, the biggest takeaway that Dave, when he explained this to me before the meeting, was the interwoven nature of our community mm -hmm. that we often take for granted. Mm -hmm. It's, as he said, it's not different agencies slash foundations slash companies touching each other. It's it's all interwoven in this uh, intricate tangled web that no one can explain uh, but exists and, and it works wonderfully for us and is very unique uh, in this kind of community or any kind of school district actually. And, and, uh, and having the input from those folks tell us what we need was, is very important. I thought that was great. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Vander Kellen mentioned earlier the, the developmental assets that are available in a community. And I've done some work in that area with other communities, and it's really unique to see them tied together so well in this community and the way it supports different groups of people. And I, I can't stress enough, I was talking with some of the most sophisticated members of your community, because you could just tell when they came in, but they were worried about the families that are struggling, the kids that are struggling with poverty. Um, and and they had numbers, facts, figures. Um, it was just it was just really remarkable. Um, if my kids were a lot younger, this would be a well. They really don't need to <laughs> raise them anymore, hopefully. Uh, but <laughs> but this would be a community where I'd want my kids to grow up. You know, it, it, and it, you learn a lot about this uh, community real quickly in these processes. So um, you're very fortunate. And, and the expectation um, historically of those very people you're speaking of is that our superintendent be on boards of those organizations and 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 play intimately in that sphere mm -hmm. via boards and other things and so I think we have that same expectation of the new superintendent going forward yeah and and they expect the the superintendent to play a role in that leadership and say listen these are the emerging needs in our community yep. both educational and non-educational let's get on the same page and let's do something about it and and so that's it, it's very impressive well, and I also think the key part where you were talking about innovation is going to be critical to us going forward is charters are going to be able to come in. So we need somebody who knows how to compete. Uh, to, to that point, all of education is, is going like this, uh, primarily as a result of uh, the expectations of a global economy and that interacting with, with changing technology. And so you're hearing the same thing from your community that's going on all over the place. Uh, ready to switch, talk about interviews. Um, you got a way too lengthy packet um, from, uh, from us on this interview process, so I'm just gonna hit the highlights uh, with these slides. And uh, surprise, surprise, you'll end up with more work as a result of that, just what you needed. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the recommended uh, interview and selection process overall, the first interview, the second interview, just a brief uh, point on contract considerations, um, the site visit, uh, confirmation of the superintendent, um, and then sample interview questions and, and some technicalities around the interviews that you'll be conducting. Um, I assume they'll be in this room, President Westerman, yeah. Um, 
So uh, just a, a quick overview again, um, our timeline, and we believe we're going to be able to meet it, is that we'll present you a candidate slate on the 29th. A uh, reminder that that is a closed uh, session until the board announces who they intend to interview. And you will do that the evening of the 29th, unless you want time to deliberate. You can take it. Um, but the plan would be that you'd announce that slate on the 29th, and at that point, uh, those names become public. So, so Cindy, what we'll need to do for the 29th is say we're going to have a closed session, that we go to an open session thereafter. And if, and if the open se session on the 29th is, gee, we're going to deliberate some more, Mm -hmm. That's fine. If it is announcing the candidates for interview, we'll be we'll be doing it then. So and we'll we'll go to close. We'll have a closed and then finish with an open. Yeah, you got to always start with an open yeah. to go to closed. Yeah. Two or three minutes. Yeah, I I want to prepare the board for what happens on the 29th, especially those of you who have not been through a superintendent search, especially in the days of uh, modern technology. Uh, immediately, certain people in your community will begin. Um, Googling <laughs> the candidates, primarily that, um, will begin contacting their districts. Um, uh, union leadership usually calls the union leadership in the district. Um, name the kind of employee you have and they contact um, comparable employees in the districts. Um, parents will start calling parents and relatives and all that's going to start coming back to you in different ways. Um, I would strongly encourage you this early in the process to simply say thank you. I understand your input. If you have something to say that you want all the board to hear, you should come to uh, one of the board meetings. Um, but thank you very much. Um, to start engaging the community early in the process about individual candidates is, is one of the things that derails searches. Um, we will try to make you, in, in this day and age, especially school superintendents, it's very rare to find somebody who doesn't have someone negative, something negative to say about someone. We'll try to make you aware of what you may hear in that range, and then you can decide uh, how you want to address it. But um, believe me, if you, if you Googled my last three years, um, you would think I was not a nice guy, and I am. Um, but, it, you know, things happen. Um, <laughs> um, uh, we will then schedule, um, wh when you announce the slate, we will schedule the first interviews for you. You'll, you'll have that all mapped out, and we'll take care of scheduling that um, and uh, set that up. And right now we have the week, uh, May 6, six 7, and 8 uh, targeted for that. Um, first interview preparation. Um, you will, um, the, on the 29th, you will get a full packet on all candidates, okay? And each board member will have that, so you'll have their application, their resume, anything else that we've prepared. And you will have that to study uh, before the first interview. You will have uh, interview questions prepared. Um, you've got, I think, an hour and 15 minutes allocated, President Wasserman. Um, that's going to allow each board member to ask two or three questions. Our recommendation that that goes uh, President Wasserman sets the stage with the candidates and he asks the first easy question um, to put the candidate at ease. Um, and then you ask one question in rotation one time around, second time around, time permitting three times around. Um, and he'll set the stage for them saying we have an hour and 15 minutes, we're going to have um, 21 questions or 18 questions and that's all you need to do, see how the candidate does in, in being uh, succinct uh, with their time. A board member should feel free if something that a candidate says intrigues you, follow up, but try to limit your follow-ups to one question. Okay, um, Every one of these first candidates should be asked the same set of questions. The follow-ups don't have to be the same, but, but the questions should be the same so that you can do apples to apples comparisons. Um, I have a question. So yeah. of that hour and 15 minutes, is there a specific time where they're allowed to ask us questions back? Or uh, is that just uh, as we're asking questions, they can interject? I would recommend that you, you leave them five to ten minutes to ask you questions. Um, th this is a two-way process all the way through. So as you ask the, as you ask the questions, um, they will be looking at the way you ask them. Um, they're going to be looking at the way you listen to them. Um, it's a two-way two -way street here all along because uh, you're trying to decide if it's a match and so are they. If, if they end up the being offered the position. Um, we had talked early in the process, and I didn't know whether you wanted to continue to do that, of having 
because the the uh, sessions are held in public, I think you had mentioned, President Wasserman, that during your last search, uh, people in the audience could turn in cards at the conclusion of the interviews yeah, with, we, with feedback? Yeah, they, they could write cards during the interview, and then you or one of your peers yeah, would yeah. collect them so that at the end of the interview, if there was time, you could introduce, you could ask those questions on behalf of the audience okay. that may have come forward. Okay. We have included a form if the board wants to do that again uh, that you can use for that. And you can also, that we would also just encourage the board to just keep that as another data point. And Dave, not to go into the weeds and you and I can talk it later, oftentimes those questions would end up being a question we asked five minutes after they wrote it. And right. Get it to you, so right. you'd be able to go, no, I'm not going to do that one. Yeah. You don't even yeah. have to read it. Just, they, they also can serve as... Um, if, if they're particularly complex questions, they can also serve as a basis for your questions in the second round if that okay. candidate moves forward. Um, um, the interview questions. Um, it, it's important to us that this is one of the things the board has to do on their own. Now, what we've done is prepare for you a, a long list of questions that sample pretty much er every area of expertise in, in school administration, particularly the superintendency, that you can use to model your questions. Um, I'm not sure what process you want to do to do that, but we basically want to get to the point by the first interviews that every board member has three questions that they're going to ask in round one of the interviews, and that those th that when the entire board is sampled, we've sampled every one of those areas that are included in that. Um, the typically, uh, board members look through that list, maybe draft two or three questions of particular interest to them, um, forward those to President Wasserman. He can see if there's any duplications, send them to me. I can work on them a little bit and bring them back and then round them around we that recycle way. Recycle one time yep. so that everybody can then say, okay, this looks like a good list, or gee, I'd really rather see this rather than that. Um, right. Okay, why don't we proceed that way? Okay. Um, so literally go through that list, take a look at your areas of interest, um, draft, you know, use those as a basis, and then draft uh, questions. Um, when, when you draft your questions, um, just a little guidance on that. Um, don't ask questions on complex school district issues where these initial candidates may, in other words, what do you think about the way we set forth our sinking fund uh, proposal and our bond? Because the candidates may not have information on that. They end up asking you questions back and forth, and it ends up being a question that doesn't give you a lot of data. Um, so keep your questions focused on the big, important issues, and try to include a behaviorally-based component to that question. You want to get at their attitudes and values, and then you want an example of how they did it. Yeah, that second um, point, having interviewed for Dow for many, many years in the current company, you cannot emphasize enough, give me an example of this behavior, because uh, everything else is just pablum. Yeah. Everybody you, will tell you the right answer. If you, you ask me if I'm in favor of international baccalaureate, bingo. If you ask me to give concrete examples of innovative programs that I've implemented in my current district, what obstacles did I run into, and how did I get around them? Um, also, you want to know about this person's uh, attitudes, their reasoning ability. You know, are they smart? <laughs> um, uh, judgment in areas of interest to the board. Do they, are they going to use the kind of judgment the board would expect them to use? Um, and I just talked about don't ask leading questions where the answer is obvious. Um, we talked about um, you can compile them and you and I can work together on them, and then we can route them back and get a second, mm -hmm. second gloss on them. Um, interview and selection. Um, we talked about uh, President Wasserman setting the stage and asking the first question. Um, questions in rotation. Um, talked about that. Brief follow-ups. We talked about that. Um, during the interviews of the five candidates, it will facilitate the decision making even if you take a break between candidates and between days that the board not discuss the candidates until you've seen all five or six. Um, 
try not to fall in love with anybody <laughs> without hearing what the other board members have to say. You're all going to have your your opinions on people, and you're going to have careful notes, and you know you may give a big star beside somebody's name, but hold off until the final discussion of all the candidates occur so that you can all profit from what other board members have to say. Um, and during the interview, um, remember that the candidates should do most of the talking. Um, this is not a, t you've, you've had your chance to say what you're looking for in the superintendent. Now, now it's to find out if they've got it. So ask your question. If they, if it's a dumb answer, write that down in your notes. <laughs> um, um, remember the candidates are interviewing as you, you as well. Make sure they walk away thinking this is the board that they will want to work with. Um, give positive feedback to all the candidates at the end of the interview. Um, take extremely careful notes um, f on each candidate because you're going to have to come back and you will find that you have different recollections of what people had to say um, because you'll key in on one thing. So if, if you take really good notes um, while maintaining co eye contact with them, it's a challenge, but um, uh, it's, it will be helpful to you. Uh, narrowing the pool. Here's the problem. Um, you have to discuss someone's um, whole professional career and their ability to respond to your questions, and you have to do it in public in a way that's humane to them. So we have a recommended process here uh, for doing that. Um, we'd like each board member, let's say you have candidate A, B, C, D, E, and F. We'd like each board member, what you've conducted all your interviews, we'd like each board member to comment on candidate A's strengths and go right around the table. Continue until you've all have finished and then ask for any closing statements that any board member might have about a candidate A. You know, I really think candidate A has potential to be a good fit for the district. We have another interview left to go, but um, I would really like to see this candidate in the slate, something like that. Do that for all five candidates. And then um, I have to be careful of the term I use. Um, th th there's something to do with straw polls that we have to be careful about. But what we suggest is, is that at the conclusion of that, and keep going around the board, there's no limit. If you want to, if I've got another comment I want to make, but they're all positive. So you keep going around until everybody's exhausted that. You've all listened carefully to one another. Then you take a piece of paper, um, write down the five names. Five is the highest, one is the lowest. Pass them over to Mr. Wasserman. He, he compiles those. If, if any candidate has a score of five, there's no need to further discuss that candidate anymore. It's over. Um, unless someone, you have a right to, pro, you know, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. But um, basically, if two are at the bottom of that, you're done. Or three. Um, the two to three candidates with the highest ballot scores should be selected unless further discussion is needed. And then again, um, that's uh, the president's job to make sure, is there any other thing that you want to say about this before we conclude that these are the three candidates we're moving forward? If you could move three forward, it will give you more options. And we have reserved three dates for three final candidates. That's correct. Um, we want to expect the best and plan for the worst. Um, it has happened that you'll move two candidates forward and the second candidate will accept a job or say, you know what, I'm, I'm withdrawing and then you've limited your options. So three if you can do it. We've talked about this. Um, simply put, the press and other media will possibly print or broadcast comments. In your case, these comments are, are uh, uh, televised. I will give you a concrete example of this in a uh, district um, not too far, far from here. One of the board members commented on a candidate um, oh, our community would eat him alive. The other board members did not agree with that. The candidate withdrew. Um, and they lost a very good candidate who the community would not have eaten alive, but that comment was made public and the person said, I, I'm not gonna be embarrassed in front of my family. Um, and it, so, you know, just remember that as, as you evaluate candidates. They should not hear about their weaknesses or poor responses in a public forum. They are going to be nervous no matter how experienced they are. Second interview, um, we had talked about um, a writing sample being collected before the second interview. Um, I'll make a couple of suggestions on what I think those stems ought to be. It ought to be something clear, 
that represents clearly communication skills, not their research skills. So oftentimes we do, I'm not going to say what the example is so that everybody can watch it on TV, but I'll, I'll send that to you in an email. Uh, you want to sample their communication skills, not their ability to do research on the district. Um, the way we do the writing samples um, to ensure integrity is, is I make an appointment with each of your finalists um, and send them uh, the uh, writing stem and they have one hour to complete it and one hour to send it back to me. So they don't, um, it minimizes the chance of any ghostwriting. Uh, not that we've ever had a problem like that, but it, just to ensure the integrity of the process. Um, during that second, prior to that second interview, you may want to have the uh, superintendent of the district uh, meet with the candidate to respond to any questions. Many of them will contact uh, him unilaterally on their own. Um, they also will probably likely have toured the district in one way or another. Um, We've had candidates go to the elementary school just to see how they're accepted and say, I'm thinking about moving here, um, and, uh, which they are. And, uh, it's a, and uh, they, they like to do a little sampling of, of what's going on in the district and, and what people have to say. Um, I had a, we had a candidate that walked around the uh, Kroger and just asked everybody they saw, so how do you feel about the Midland Public Schools? It wasn't Midland, but uh, I'm putting this example. But people collect data in a lot of ways. Not uh, to be too anecdotal, but when we did the last search, when we did our, when we did our site visit, I'll reverse that. We went to the local McDonald's and asked that question. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> For about yeah. an hour before the yeah. meeting. I always <laughs> like to find the barber shop uh, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the hair shop where everybody does their stuff, where all the opinions are formed <laughs> very quickly. Um, and then we had talked somewhere during that process about having a, a presentation by the candidate on some topic where board members could simply see what that is. Yeah, just to, you know, pick a to we'll pick a topic and ask them to prepare a brief uh, presentation so that you can get a sample of uh, their speaking uh, skills. Um, I believe we talked that we we're going to have some kind of a, a district tour for the candidates on the second day. Uh, a dinner with the board, um, a meeting with Cindy so she can decide who she likes the most. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, that's important. Um, and then, and then you're going to enter the process uh, of candidate selection, which which should mirror um, the same process that you used previously. And, and the way we have that scheduled now, um, and we can play it a little by ear. We have it scheduled now. If we want to, we can do it the night after the third, inter the last interview. Assume it's the third, we have it scheduled for that night. We've also reserved the next night. Mm -hmm. So if we're not, I'll call it in the mood to want to come back after all of this, which I, I will tell you based on past history, we probably will not right. want to come back after the third night of dinner and everything else. We'll probably take that fourth night for us to reconvene here in a public meeting and do the same thing we did in the first yeah. round yep. after what we've learned. I think that's a, a good idea to let things just sit uh, for a night. You've got the, you, you're going to be able to do that. And, it, and it, you, this, is, this is the point where you really want to make sure that you've all thought clearly through um, what it is. Um, I will be there that night to facilitate that discussion if it would be helpful to you. Um, and then that final phase, once you've decided on that um, candidate who you believe is the finalist, you haven't employed them yet, you've said this is, this is our person, um, is for uh, each board member to do two reference checks. We will ask the candidate to supply 14 references across a, uh, a, an entire range of areas. So you will talk to parents, teachers, board members, uh, community members and uh, randomly assign those to each board member so that each of you can make two calls uh, to the, the candidate's uh, current community. Um, and then you can share uh, the results of those with each other by email, I presume, or calls or... Dave, let me ask some yeah. questions about this part of the process. Yes. So we've gone through this and we will have clearly articulated Sue is number one. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously we come out of that selection meeting. So now we're gonna go do references on Sue. Let's assume those references come back and set off alarm bells. We go, uh-oh, you know, not so sure about Sue. How do we, how do we handle that? How do we do that? We have to do it in a public setting. Mm -hmm. So we have to do that in a public setting. Let's assume we decide that we don't want to pursue Sue, and now we want to go pursue Joe. Is Joe still going to be inclined to want to come after he was told he was not number one? 
Um, it's an excellent question, and what we try to do is preserve Joe for you. And 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 I want to tell you that the, the the way to avoid that is it it's going to triple your work, but you could do th the reference so checks we, on the front end. At the front end, where we each do where, where you each do six. six on all three, and, and that may clarify the decision making. That and we and we would have a two week period to do those six. That's right, because there's a week so built we put in that there. Extra week built in. And, and that's why I've asked this question. That heads that off. I've had this discussion. It heads that so off. I would ask the board's preference. I mean, because it, it's extra work for each of us, but it could avoid the embarrassment. We will have the references in our hip pocket then when we're doing the final selection process versus doing a uh-oh, potentially. And then the two candidates said, never mind. If I'm not number one, why don't I gonna embarrass myself come back? Right. So what are you, I'm going to go around for head nods. Do, are you willing to do six reference checks in the two weeks between the first selection and the final selection? I, I know one of, the, that. one of the board presidents that I talked to when we were investigating search firms commented on how valuable that was mm -hmm. to their process. Mm -hmm. So I think based on that, definitely beforehand would give us another data point. And willing to do the extra minutes. calls. Right. Scott? Yeah, I agree. John? I'm okay. I would be willing. Same, I'd be willing. A great idea. Got our answer. We're okay. going to go. We're going to do six, and we'll do it right after beginning, right Perfect. after the yep. the first cut. If you want to call yep. that. Um, okay, so that goes well, and you've selected your number one candidate. Um, site visit involves as many board members as possible. We have we limited to three last time. Not that we oh. have to. Okay. Not that we have to. But we are concerned about what's this mean for open meetings if four of us go. You got a point. Hmm? Post it and go. <laughs> you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't think anybody's going to drive. For, well, you know, but but you can. And some boards want everybody to go. Most don't. But um, um, you know, at, at this point, I got to tell you, it's going to be highly unlikely that anything goes wrong on this site visit. Okay. This is just your final stage of due diligence. Um, at this point, you've com you've emotionally committed yourself to a candidate, and the candidates emotionally committed themselves to you. Um, so the candidates make sure these meetings go pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> I will tell you from Lynn was on the last Lynn went, didn't you? And yeah, I think Lee. it was in Lee. Lee. It it serves to make you feel good that you reconfirms all the reasons why. Okay, mm -hmm. you you typically. I heard better than I thought from the interviews when we did the site visit. Right. I would, to your point, Dave, I don't expect it to get worse. Yeah. Um, but it's a reconfirmation. Okay. And Our it's going to be a function. We've set a date for it. Uh, the candidate will be available that date by definition. And we've set two dates uh, because if it's something local, we could do it relatively fast. If it's something that's more remote and requires a day's worth of travel to get there, then we've reserved a day for travel and a day for the, the site visit. So once we know who the candidate is, we can then say who wants to go mm -hmm. and figure out how to get there. But doing that ahead of time is yeah. more wishy-washy depending on which day we go and the travel involved. And we generally give the candidate general guidelines for that um, visit, the amount of time, and let them set it up so that you can see what who they chose for you to see. And and the and the quality that went into the setting up the visit. Contract. I think you've already begun this process, but um, you need to be ready with your contract by the round of the first interviews. Um, we're going to. Uh, I, I'm going to work with President Wasserman um, and getting you comparable um, districts so that you have a, a notion of compensation, um, ballpark. Um, we're going to do our level best to not bring you any candidate you can't afford um, <laughs> so that we don't uh, have that situation come up. Um, you should all know what's in the basic scaffolding of the contract well before you select the final candidate and have agreement on that among yourselves as to the basic provisions. Um, the board president usually negotiates uh, the contract with the candidate within the constraints that have been established with the board. So there'll be a maximum salary, a maximum benefit package. Um, 
don't be surprised and don't be offended if the candidate tries to negotiate for more salary or benefits. Um, this is their only chance in this environment. Um, they, they go to any superintendent's conference and there'll be five sessions on get it in the first contract because you're not going to get it in any subsequent contracts. Um, so expect them to do that. Expect them to have counsel uh, review it. Um, their, their counsel at their expense. Um, but that's a standard part of the process uh, that they do, and it's, it's a good idea. It protects you and it protects them. Um, and that is how the process will work in a nutshell. There are, of course, a lot of small steps within each one of those, but uh, that's what you're facing over the next month or so. And Dave, again, um, to expedite the next steps while you're here, um, I've sketched out while you were talking a proposed timing process for the interview questions. That's the first question at hand. Okay. The next question at hand is I'll go off with Dave one-on-one -on -one and discuss how we begin a process on the contract. That's another one we have to do parallel to all of this so we're prepared. Uh, but I'm looking for your feedback. I'm just sketching something down that meets our timelines and gives us some time to get things done. If we will get in your hands tomorrow all these slides so that you can see if you don't have them already I, I, we got to send them out we can send them out that's what i thought that they're in everybody's hands go through and look at what the community and we as board has said we want for the superintendent and formulate your first pass questions you'd want to ask if you would and get them back to me by sunday april 21st okay so that'd be a week if you get them to me by sunday april 21st I'll be forwarding them on to Dave. I'll have Dave or Dave and I, whichever way he wants to handle it, uh, to consolidate the questions. There'll be many that are the same or nearly the same. We'll consolidate those down and then also look at what people have said, the community and we've said ourselves, we want for attributes and look if there's any holes. It could very well, we all ask the same question on this and don't ask the question about that. And, and we'll come back and say this hole is there and we propose these questions to fill that hole. I would commit to getting that done by the next Friday. Okay. Okay. So we'd have the work week of okay. through April 26th to have that done and get back to you on that next weekend then. Okay. And it, so you'd have a list of questions. Um, the only part we need to build in there, Jerry, is about three or four days for our human uh, resources expert, Larry, to take, once the questions are finalized, we'll build a process of building rubrics on each of those questions and give you look-fors. We call them look-fors. And it's um, look for the following theme or example in an answer to this question. If it's present, it means the person knows what they're talking about. Okay. Um, it's up to you to judge tone and that type of thing, but we'll give you some ways to, it, it's not precise, but you basically, it gives you a way to score answers. Um, you have that by April 26th for a May 6th, 7th, and 8th interview. Oh, easy, easy, okay. easy. Because yeah. then, then what you, we'll go back to you by, uh, we'll identify the holes and come back to you with a, I'll call it, uh, consolidated list of questions based on what you all input. Then I'd give you several days, because you wouldn't need eternity at that point, to say, yeah, but you still missed this, and or I'd like to add that, and, and get us back. And then by by about the middle of that week, the Wednesday, which would be about the May 1st mm -hmm. time frame, hand to Dave the final questions, and then he would do his rubric thing and come back. Did that meet your needs to be? Yes. So if we follow that, it'd be like end of this week on first pass, we'd take five days to get you second pass back. You'd have a few days then to comment back to us on what's missing or what you'd like to have rephrased and then we would be done formulating the questions. And then the only question is parsing them up. And what I might do is just call you and say, which two are your favorite that you'd like to ask and give them to you. Or just email you, say what are the two. I, could be, I don't have to worry about open meeting on asking your preference on a question you ask. And, uh, and Mr. the only thing I'd add to that is, is during the interview process, uh, Mr. Wasserman has the uh, um, unpopular task of if there's too many probing questions asked or too many follow-ups, he's going to have to move the move, move the on. move it along. Um, if the candidate's wandering about, let that go on a bit longer because it tells you something about the way they communicate. Exactly. Um, <laughs> uh,
Yeah, go ahead, Betty. Um, yes, at the conclusion of the interview, we um, uh, asked the, we tried to set aside 10 minutes for the candidate to ask questions of board members. And then at the final part of that, uh, Mr. Wasserman will ask the candidate to present some kind of a closing statement. Okay. So the board needs to be prepared for the statement for the questions they may be asked. Yes. Yeah. And we never know what they're going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we're prepared. <laughs> and do we handle that? That it's always I, directed to you initially, or how is that? If the candidate asks an individual board member, I'd let that board member answer it, because okay. it could be like a follow-up to something asked earlier. If it's a generic question, I will tend to ask, would somebody care to answer that? Okay. Okay, and look if someone's eager to, or everybody kind of goes like one of these, then I'll handle it, uh, but we'll play that by ear based on how the question's asked. Yeah. If it smells awful lot like one of your two, that you ask, but he isn't addressed it to you, I may come back and ask you to answer it because it was in line with the two questions you asked. Yeah. I, so I think quick on my feet to do that. Yeah. I expect that the questions will be asked to the entire board and expectation to, it's pretty unlikely a candidate would put a single board member on the spot. Yeah. By asking and him and I'll tend to dole it out. Um, the reason I'll dole it out is when we get to the final, you know, final candidate and we're in negotiations, while I didn't want to learn a lot about the person, it's too late. I mean, we have, we have learned. But he'll have plenty of interaction with me as the future board president during the negotiating process. And what I want him to do is get as much interaction with you as individual board members before that, which is why I will tend to push that off to you if I can. If you're uncomfortable, you know, I may, I'll probably do something like, Angela, would you prefer to question, answer that question? And you can easily say, no, Jerry, I'd prefer you or another board member answer that question. That's fine. That's not embarrassing. No. No. Um, if a little bit on contract negotiation. Um, some boards will ask us to get involved in the negotiations process with the candidate. The, the reason we recommend that that not be done is it gets in the way of clear communication. This is the beginning of the employment relationship between the board and the candidate, and we think it's important that that go on between the two of them. And that that also applies to this lawyer thing. The one, the board uses its attorney as they see fit. We tell the candidates, D you can get a legal review, but don't get the lawyer involved in negotiating your contract with the board. That's, it, it can be the kiss of death because um, all apologies to any lawyers in, on the board or in the audience. Sometimes the the lawyers will get really interested in a very small part of the contract that doesn't mean anything in the big picture, and we don't want that to become a point of contention. So we always tell the candidates, you continue to keep your communication open with the board president. And from an Open Meetings Act perspective, I'm allowed to go to each of you individually and ask your opinion and ask for your input on a particular thing. Okay, so if there are five issues, I can say, mm -hmm. what do you think about this issue, that issue, that issue? Thank you, and I can go to the next candidate and ask that, or next board member, and ask that same question. What I can't do is tell board member two what board member one told me, okay? So you can bet this gets into a lot of phone calls uh, real fast in terms of this negotiation as it, as it moves along potentially, because I gotta touch six bases on every issue that comes up to make sure I've really got a board consensus. I'm the only one that will know what that board consensus was because it's not a board consensus, it's a collection of individual thoughts. So can we help that along by setting some pretty good parameters? We will do that. Beginning? We will do that long before. Okay. There will be, I will know the boundaries right. long before I get there. Mm -hmm. That's what Dave and I will talk about is how do we, what do we put out there? I'm looking for his advice. I got the current contract. I'm going to sit there and go, okay, we modeled it after the current contract. What are the boundaries? And then I'll also be asking Dave with his expertise what's mm -hmm. missing in this thing or what needs to be deleted from this thing based on, on past practice. Questions? Nope. So, okay. So April 21st, you have your assignment. It's in your emails already on that presentation. So April 21st, I'll be hounding you for what your questions will be based on that. Uh, please don't try to give me 100 <laughs> because that'll be impossible. But if, but if each of you can come with like, come with six. Okay, that would be 42 different questions. There'll be many duplicative, that's fine. But if you come with six, I, we can sort through that. Yep. That'd be almost 50 we yep. sort through. 
Um, my, I guess my question at this point, and then and then we can conclude, is do you have uh, any questions? Do you feel, feel fairly well prepared for this first step of the process? Um, understand the constraints? Um, I, I, I certainly don't feel the need to go over them with you, but please carefully review at the end of the questions uh, the illegal questions that you may not ask. If a candidate brings up their family, you're free to ask them questions about it, but you can't ask them about their family to start with. Um, marital status, anything else? Um, and, 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 and I think your packet, I haven't read it yet, will guide us. What are we allowed to ask and not ask? You saw the community feedback. You've heard board expectations. We expect this, we expect this person to be part of our community, mm -hmm. part and parcel, and well integrated in our community. I know I can't ask, are you willing to move here? Or can I? What am you I can. allowed to legally you can. ask about the, being here? Look at the, the, the final, there's a big box at the end of the sample questions that says, do not ask any of these questions. Um, that is the basic parameters of things that you may not ask a candidate. Um, and, but other things like, are you, would you be willing to move to Midland is, is fair game. Um, um, you know, are, how, how much, how visible will you be in the community? Give us some concrete examples. Um, how many nights a week are you willing to work? I mean, this this is uh, you you have broad yeah, those are, no, things over those. Um, it's just uh, it it's basically um, the the standard illegal questions that probably most of you are aware of that you cannot ask. Unless, but if the candidate brings them up, then it's fair game. Okay, and and you may just want um, your uh, district's attorney to look and see if I've captured all of them there. Um, I believe I have, but sometimes they'll have an additional piece of advice for the board, so you may just want to take a quick glance at them. I will do that. Any other questions or concerns? None? Is there an item for action, or is that just us setting up our, um, our timeline? It's, it's just basically, no, we don't need a it's motion. A, it's a to-do list. It's a to-do list. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, gotcha. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a motion. So the first step is, please, by Sunday, Gotcha. Go through oh, that yeah. stuff and ask me your questions. Review the not ask questions and formulating them, and and give me up to doesn't have to be six, but give me up to six, based Good. on what you think are the Good. key questions. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. That's it. Is there anything else we need, Dave? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the fun now begins. Um. I think that's uh all we have to do for this evening, if not mistaken. Anything else for the good of the order from anybody? Seeing none, we stand adjourned. <laughs>